Good afternoon, colleagues. All. Um, I think we, know, we all know why we are here. I'm going to try to make my comments as, as short as possible. I do have a ten I'm, 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 registered as, I'm registered as JCF, Dr. Taylor, that's why. Okay, all right, and, um, and I think I understand what that, what that means, that you don't have any separate identity from the JCF. <laughs> no, 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 it, it, it means that I bring the weight of the JCF on me, on my shoulder. Like this, I'm so just, the JCF strength is JCF strong, eh? Yes, I'm the old JCF behind me. <laughs> there you go, there you go. All right. Um, I, 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 not, I don't know the names of the panelists, so perhaps you could just inform. We can do that in a minute, yes. All right, great. Right. So, in essence, you know, we know what topic is. It's an effects based approach to build resiliency, considering, a, um, you know, the range of scenarios that we're facing here today. Now, there is no easy answer. There's no one answer. And I like the, very, the fact that we have a panel here that is, by any stretch of the imagination, very distinguished. And the other panel is, is a person who I do know. Some people I know a little longer than others. I know Tony Harriet, Professor Tony Harriet is Professor of Political so Sociology in the Department of Government and Institute of Criminal Justice and Security in the Faculty of Social Sciences. I've known Tony from he was at the Scientific Research Council. I met him know, know that I remember that. Of course, I remember all of him. Yes, yeah, my brother used to work there together back then, way back in the day. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, bless you. Um, he has had a, a significant number of publications, of course, that is why he's professor. Um, and his research interest is, includes violence, and primarily, um, particularly ordinary criminal violence and the processes that attend the development of high level um, violence in society. And um, also police and police reform in Caribbean society. And he has also, he has crossed the gap between theory and praxis in many ways. Um, Professor Christopher Charles, oh my gosh, again, I, I remember him when we used to eat. He was a KC boy while well, I was at St. George's, but he's a research associate in the psychology department, in the, no, in the psychology department at CUNY, but he's a full-time professor in the department of government on the plantation called University of the West Indies, where I also work. He's a psychologist with teaching and research experience. And I remember when we were looking at our first sets of publications together. Herbert Gale, uh, like myself, is a migrant from the Faculty of Arts and General Studies. With that kind of acronym, please do not pronounce it. Um, we are in the Department of Sociology, Psychology of Social Work. He's an anthropologist and social researcher who is very competent in both quantitative um, and qualitative methodologies, as well as a mixed method. So in fact, that's all three. Um, he's here to talk about, you know, why crime keeps rising in spite of all of the efforts. And I will admit my bias because we sit in the same department and we um, have a lot of ground. Professor Tony Clayton um, is Alcan Professor of Caribbean Sustainable Development at the UWI, the same plantation where the other two of us were. Um, he currently serves as a member of the Government Climate Change Advisory Board. I don't think he's here because of the Sahara dust. Uh, he's a member of the Jamaica, Jamaican Government um, Rule of Law Committee and is Deputy Chairman of the JCF Operational Reform Oversight Committee. Professor Clayton's research is based on policy analysis, futures, studies and scenarios, strategic planning. Now, we also have um, Brigadier Raj Mason, who I'm told will be speaking as a presenter, but he is a member of the JDF Stop Brass with more than 30 years of experience. Um, Brigadier Mason holds the post of Brigadier, Brigade Commander of the Jamaica Res Regiment with oversight responsibility for forces, regular infantry battalions. He served in the role of acting Colonel General Staff with responsibility for force policy on operations, training, intelligence, communication, and a number of other things. He's a, a international fellow of the US War College, graduating in 2017. And, um, Commissioner Blake, uh, I'm looking for, for your bio here. I don't have your bio, but you are, but, uh, you are also joining us or you're observing. Uh, uh, that might have, I might have missed that. 
I, I, let me let me just clarify. Um, I think I wasn't hearing you well, but I'm really an observer, and not necessarily a panelist. Okay, but okay, right. but, so but willing but, to contribute but, if so, necessary. But Dr. Kevin Kevin Blake, Commissioner of Police in Jamaica Constabulary Force. He has approaching a, well, you're not quite you're about 18 year service in the yeah. last time I checked, somewhere around there. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> not doing very badly. And my name is Orville Taylor. I wear a number of hats, as small as my head is, but I have a very, very strong interest in all of the things here um, from the all of the areas that everybody here is interested in. Um, I myself like to believe that I cross the gap between theory and praxis, and I make no apologies about the underground association I've had with the organization that Dr. Blake himself serves. As a matter of fact, I think I remember when he joined. <laughs> so without further ado, gentlemen, I talked a little bit too much. I'm going to ask Prof. Harriet to start off with us. Um, they say 10 to 15 minutes, but we understand that we're going by military time. So I'm going to ask you see if you can compress it into a shorter presentation so that we can allow for more time for discussion. So without further ado, Tony, the mic is yours. Oh, sure. Thanks, Orville. I'll try to be very brief. I don't expect to exceed 10 minutes. Uh, if I can do better, I will certainly try. Um, so, Jamaica is confronted at the moment by two crises. I'm not sure what's happening here, Tony. Um, we might be having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Let's see if we can work that out. I think I'm not hearing Tony Harriet. I'm not sure what happened, what's happening here. Can you see if you can help us to solve that out, please? Yes, I am giving him a call. Okay. You know, as a media practitioner, um, dead air is one of the most difficult things, the most painful things to handle. Eh? My light just went, so I think, yeah, electricity may have just. I'm gone. I'm back. Okay, well, we have. We are oh, hearing you. We have power cord. Uh, I think. Um, yeah. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome back, Prof. All right. Yeah, I think we had a power cord. Um. So let me proceed. Yeah, as I was saying, um, Jamaica is confronted with two crises at the moment. One is the protracted crisis of insecurity driven by high and chronic rates of violent crime. And of course, the second is the COVID pandemic. Um, a crisis, may be, crisis may be thought of as um, a kind of stress test uh, of societies. Uh, they tend to bring into focus the um, fault lines in society and, of course, test our resilience. Thus, uh, we may think of the crisis of insecurity as a stress test for our state security system or criminal justice system, um, the COVID crisis as both a test of our security systems and, of course, our health services. So there are some commonalities there. Uh, in the presentation, however, I want to focus more on the effects of COVID on our crime crisis. My argument is simple. 
It is that the COVID crisis may have been expected to spontaneously yield a measure of crime reduction. I believe that such an outcome is a reasonable expectation in any socially healthy society. Any such effect, however, must be expected to be time sensitive. It may pass fairly quickly, or it may stay for a reasonable length of time, depending on the social health of the society. But in the case of Jamaica, I would expect it to pass. Uh, fairly quickly. The spontaneously generated resilience, however, I believe holds some lessons uh, as to how we may more generally organize resilience for crime reduction. Specific, that's a specific type of resilience that I'm interested in, not a generalized diffuse resilience. Uh, so, first, let me explain the theoretical expe expectations uh, and do so in the form of describing a pathway from crisis to crime specific resilience. And then, quickly, just tease out some of the implications for crime specific resilience building. Ah, that sounds like a mouthful, but I'll be very brief. So the idea then is that these kinds of crises will generate increased solidarity in society. And to get crime-specific results, solidarity must be converted to guardianship. So that's the tricky point in the pathway that I want to focus on. I would like us to devote some policy focus um, so that we may apply this idea to reducing the rates of violent crime in the society. So we begin with crises as shocks that generate elevated levels of solidarity. Um, the solidarity is expressed in terms of feelings of connectedness, perhaps a weird, greater awareness of our interdependence. In other words, it's a helping disposition, a supportive orientation. Uh, however, for it to be impactful for crime control, it must make the leap to guardianship. Are you hearing me? I'm gone? Oh my God, I'm gone? Oh, you're still here, Prof. Okay. So the idea then is that for solidarity to be impactful, for crime control, it must make the leap specifically to increase guardianship. So, um, for example, in a moment such as this, there was a great fear that there would be increased sexual victimization of children. Uh, my argument is that I would expect an animated guardianship to be more protective of such a vulnerable population. So my expectation is that in a healthy society, you would get the opposite. So those that expect increased sexual victimization are carrying an assumption that the society is basically socially unhealthy and incapable of generating this kind of resilience. Right. Uh, okay. Some larger examples of this kind of positive yield would be the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, where it was expected that there would be all sorts of victimization in the camps um, where people were displaced. There was no such thing because people organized themselves based on the solidarity that was in what was generated, increased significant and animated significant uh, guardianship that helped to control the situation and make people feel safe. 
So for Jamaica during the COVID moment, that is the month since March, my expectation is that we would have lower rates of predatory crime for the reasons that I just outlined. And secondly, perhaps a suspension of conflict-related violence. Okay, so if this is, this is true, then we may expect that in relation to the um, suspension of conflicts, homicides would resume perhaps with full force once the solidarity effect uh, dissipates. A quick cursory look at the data suggests um, some confirmatory evidence. Uh, the difficulty that I have is separating the COVID solidarity effects from SOE effects. So a lot more work has to be done to try to estimate the uh, independent effects of those. Uh, I figured, yeah, but I, I just turned the camera off while uh, the participants were speaking, so it does not have the distraction. Uh, that always works. Uh, all right, well, we're not having, so we, we're not getting him? I'm still trying. All right, I, I wonder. Hello? Oh yeah, he's back, all right. Yeah, so let me wrap it up. Yeah. Um, I hope that you got the pathway that I described, the expectation. Hello? Yes, we got, yeah. I certainly got it, yes. Yes, all right. we have you. Okay, good. Um, so the empirical evidence is yet to be properly explored to solve the problems that I just described. So to wrap it up, let me just look, rush to the implications on the assumption that the face assessment of the data will hold um, when more rigorous work is done. I think that this, what I'm calling COVID effect is instructive because it shows that there is a potential there for, if you wish, informally, spontaneously generated guardianship to be converted into something that is more structured, better organized, of course, with the help of the state, such that it can deliver greater restraints on the use of violence, especially in the high violence communities of Jamaica. That's the general idea that I want to use this opportunity to advocate for. That's it. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Prof. Harriet, paying attention, certainly looking forward to uh, discussing that a little bit later. Prof. Charles. Yeah, good evening. I'm just getting up my Nice. What did I say? Morning? It's an evening. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know where you are, but in Jamaica it is. <laughs> I'm in Almond Town, so okay. it's, right. it's evening here. <laughs> it's evening, evening. Make sure you put in the L. <laughs> yes, bro, go ahead. Yes, I am I am taking it just simply from a multifat multifaceted approach to solving crime. I think it's our greatest, has been our greatest challenge since independence. And normally when we think about um, solutions in Jamaica, we listen to various stakeholders. We just give solutions without putting them in a time frame. And in thinking this through, um, I'm thinking about immediate solutions, things we have to do right now. Something happens and we have to deploy our security assets between this evening and tomorrow morning. So, so we have to think in terms of immediate solutions, things to do right now. Short-term solutions, say within um, six months, medium term, within a year, long term, more than a year. And I don't want these solutions to be seen as sequential. 
right? So while you're thinking about immediate, you're thinking about short term, medium term, and long term, and so on. So they're all occurring together. It's just that the focus will be different depending on what you're doing. So for example, if one says we need to increase the size of the JDF and the JCF, and murders are high, saying that and putting it out won't help us. It's not an immediate solution, if you get the point. So the, um, the immediate solution, as I'm seeing them, we have about 15 hotspot clusters. And I say clusters because one community influences other communities. And I've never seen a situation where a police military post has failed in Jamaica. So what we have with Zoso and the state of emergency is what I call looking at care policing. The officers are, well, the, the security, the, the police and soldiers, they're at one spot, they check cars, look in a car, and things happen in the, in the zone of special operation and things happen in the area covered by state of emergency and the guys are gone. So if you put a police military post in the 15 hotspot clusters, and you keep them upward there, you keep them there for upwards of five years. So you, you have the police present, right? And they take less resources. You don't have to pass any law. You don't have to negotiate with the, with the opposition. And the gangsters will move around, right? Because they are no vulnerable because you're in all the hot spots. So they are no vulnerable. You can um, track them down using intelligence and apply. Um, the anti gang law. Short term solutions, no. Um, generally, in terms of responding to the security challenges we have in Jamaica, um, we love hard and tough policing, but we really need um, a national public education about what is happening and um, why it is happening and what we are doing and how it will be affected and so on. And we need to mobilize public support. And important to hear is what I call transparency guarantees. Um, there are reports about how security forces, physical forces have been treating um, citizens in inner city communities during the COVID and, and the curfews and so on, versus when my uptown friends uh, um, breached the curfew. They just stop waiting, sir. Um, I'm just heading home. I'm on my way home. Have a good night. That's a different, that's, a, that's an uptown response versus a response in West Kingston, Central Kingston, and East Kingston, where there are allegations that the security forces cut up bicycle tire, beat up people, and so on. Because I'm in those communities during the days, and this is what some of the residents have reported. So we need to know what is happening, and we need to, for it to be transparent, and we need to treat people fairly and equally. Also, in terms of short term, we need to be marshalling resources, and first, for, for the medium and long term solution. And we need to, in the short term, think about drawing on wide ranging professional expertise across the country rather than in terms of a partisan approach where we tend to give um, advice or positions to our friends. Um, once they're our political friends and we win and we come into power, our political friends are no experts. We have to move away from that. And then, in terms of a medium term solution. Any community we are going into, we need to have serious community profiles done beyond what you, you can get from SDC. That needs assessment. Um, this kind of that kind of assessment that the University of Western, um do for say Augustown or Mona Commons and so on, where you know everything about the community in terms of the population, how many youth. Uh, young, young people, old people, middle age, unemployment, gender dynamics, family size, family structure, detail, skills, and so on, level of education. So when you are approaching a community, when you have the police military post there, and they are there upwards of five years, and you, and you want to build the community, and you want to tackle problems and work with people, you need to know what the characteristics are. So long-term solutions now. Um, infrastructural improvements, where we seriously have to think about rebuilding the inner city, or we can use the all in the partisan approach where it's an upgrade, where you go into partnership with the people and you upgrade um, the settlement. We need to collect garbage 
we really need to outcompete the banks. And we need to think about how we can find companies to remain or to go into these committees to do business. There are ways to do it. One way is tax breaks, um, you know, to get them to go. Um, also, in terms of long term, we know that dysfunctional families um, create violence producers. And so we need to provide support um, for these families. And I'm sure um, my friend and colleague, Robert Gale, will, will go into this in detail. We also need to support the family where we use social workers in public hospitals um, to teach parenting skills, teach parenting in the schools. So for example, in the hospitals, when the, the, the parents, um, mother or father, waiting on the doctor with the child, you know, social workers, they're engaging about um, parenting and so on, you know, to, to really show up the family because dysfunctional family produce dysfunctional children who become dysfunctional adults. And so we have to contend with them as, as, as some of them, that is, as criminals. And then we have to use professionals that grow up in the inner city where they, the people know them, they are confident, they have no biases about inner city, use them as mentors. If you do a survey of universities and um, middle class professionals, um, you'll find a lot of people who are connected to these communities, whether urban or rural. In 1963, 62 rather, when we got independence, uh, the majority of Jamaicans were literate and poor. So the, the, so the, the middle class, a large, not large number of the middle class came from poor communities and we can use them um, as mentors. And we, we need to learn from successful youth programs. You can look at Germany, where they have an apprenticeship program where you connect young people to, to, to meaningful and productive activities, right? To transform them. So for example, our MTA needs to be strengthened and we need to think through what we're doing. So for example, the, 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 the job core that the JDF now runs, the, the army shouldn't have a, a training program like that when we already have a national training agency. So we need to really incorporate the job core program into heart in a very serious way, not, not a liaison way, not collaborative. Um, they, 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 our MTA is really the agency that should be running this. Um, also, if, if, if we are targeting youngsters and we are offering training, youngsters who may be peripheral members of, 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 of gangs, they're going to need resources to go to, uh, to go to heart, to wherever they're going to get training. And there are ways to determine who attends and who is actually participating. And those ways can be used to determine a stipend so that they can go to get the training and they can give the baby mother something and buy some formula for, um, for their child or children. Okay, we need to um, increase the size of the JCF and the JDF. I leave that to the experts on the ground. And we need to provide um, adequate remuneration and resources. And we also need to fight um, corruption. When it comes to inmates who are serving time, we need to prepare them for release. So we need a, a, a reintegration program. We need to prepare their families as well. So when, so when they're out, they're, uh, they're less likely to, to, to reoffend. Um, so for example, uh, Jamaica Eye Program and the CCTVs, um, I think it's a good start, but it's not broad enough. I don't see any reason why our government can't just spend the money required to put CCTVs all over, rather than rely on private persons who gang members might intimidate when there's a problem, right? We need to think through the, the command and control structure. Um, so like in, in the UK, it's a central command. I think we can think about how it's done in St. Lucia with the CCTVs where um, a police station, a particular zone, they, they are also monitoring rather than everything goes to a central location and their information is related to the police station. So we can think about that. Um, also, we can think about schools in terms of what we do, because if we capture our children um, in schools, and, and I mean this in a positive way, and, 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 um, and we, we equip them, we're going to reduce the number of youngsters that um, will be available to join gangs. So I'm going to just quickly talk about three programs. Um, 
early, the, the Professor Samson and the, the Early Child Commission, where they train mothers, you know, how to nourish and how to nurture the children. That, that program, the Early Child Commission International, recognized tough, you know, won award for it and, get, and got grants for it and so on. We need to, right? We need to, we need to, to diffuse this program nationally. This is a program that is tried and proven, internationally recognized, work wonders in terms of the bond between modern children and in terms of the development of toddlers and so on. Why, why with the evidence, we're not diffusing it? If, if, right, so we need to give our youngsters an early start. The Irish Toolbox program from Professor Ellingham at UWI, where there's a psychological toolbox in certain skills where teachers are trained for example, in empathy and other skills, how to relate to the children, it has transformed um, basic schools in um, in the in the in the um, pilot runs and so on. Another internationally recognized program, and that has been funded. It worked. It has worked wonders in the schools um, where the program was uh, rolled out. Why not diffuse this? Then we have the Dreamer World um, Cultural Resiliency Program, where in 86 primary schools, we at Caramensa, uh, through the Ministry of Education, we have been using, we have been training teachers to use cultural tools, song, dance, drama, art, poetry, and so on, to deliver the curriculum, it, right? And in those schools, we have seen a significant reduction in violence and a significant improvement in the academic performance of the children. So what am I arguing here, finally? In thinking about what I'm calling our greatest challenge, crime. Send the police into the communities um, for the long term in the hot spots, and then we engage in community development. So they'll create the safety in the hot spots, and then we develop the community in terms of working on families, working on schools, building infrastructure, and training our young people. So I think. This is just an approach. There are so many other things that I didn't mention um, that will come in the book chapter. Um, but this is my presentation about an approach. What is required is a multifaceted approach to addressing the crime problem in Jamaica. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Chris. We really appreciate that. Um, again, some very interesting stuff. Sounds like you're in the wrong department, but that's all right. Speaking of the, the, the right department, Kirby, <laughs> you're next up to bat. The mic is yours. <laughs> Just checking, um, because I'm not Herbie. Dr. Gale. Can you hear me? He was having some challenges. I'm, I'm hearing you, but I'm not hearing. So I heard some hearing. challenges. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm now hearing you, Herbie. Yes. All right. Okay. You're not in the same room with Charles, are you? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. So, so uh, I want us to look at some of the basic needs for youth development, uh, and uh, what we're looking at here is basically how we maintain uh, the stability of youth, uh, especially in developing states. All right, so. All right, uh, can you move the slide? For, right. So if we look at, if we start by looking at Jamaica, the first thing we we'll recognize is that we're located in the LAC. And I often like to remind the people uh, of this because quite often we forget uh, the region we're in. Right, we account for 9.5 percent of world population in the, the latest I've seen, and 39.7 percent of murders. So, in this region, the core reason for violence is related to the legacy of colonization. Once called the New World, this region has failed miserably to make the transition from being owned to self ownership. One of the core crises 
uh, is, is that its governments have not found the right mix between social development and use of force. All right. In the past decade, more than uh, most of the countries that we've assessed, uh, and by we I mean the entire team of people who keep working together in terms of Europe and the states, we found that more than 50%, uh, most of these countries rely on more than 50% mixed reliance on force. All right, next slide. But the problem is, th this is the problem we're having. All right, force is only of effectiveness when it has something called legitimacy. Legitimacy we are explaining, I'm explaining here, is something like what mothers have. A mother can see you in crossroads and smack you in the face in a Jamaican context, and you don't raise your hand because she has fed you, she has been there for you, she has done everything for you. So she has created this thing that Charles Tilly and others and living stone and, and killing reef and other writers have focused on call legitimacy. She can act and you will not act in retaliation because she has met the, the expected, expected promises uh, in the relationship between the two. Most, most governments in the developing world and especially in the LAC has no such legitimacy. And therefore, those of us who from violent studies background normally warn that's, that Caribbean and other LAC states weigh very carefully their use of force because use of force quite often trigger what is called, what people call justifiable retaliation. If this mix is poorly worked, it keeps the transition from being owned to self-ownership for longer. And the longer it goes on, the worse the problems become. In any violent studies class, Jamaica would represent one of the worst in the world. Always, in any basic class you go into, Jamaica is always going to be used. From 1974 until now, we remain adamant that fire requires fire. Fire requires fire has been the main frame since 1974. The bottom line is that there can be no security without ontological security. And that's what I want to speak to us for the next few minutes, next 10 minutes. What is ontological security? It's a feeling that the future is safe and that the people who, who lead are the authority, the authority figures, beginning from your parents to the government, that they are, that they care about your future and that they actually recognize that you have a future. So let's let me let me change the slide, please. Let me let me look with you at at a situation so you understand. Just a second. Yeah, just a second. I'm good. Um, other participants and everyone else in um in this forum, could you mute your mics for me, please? We're getting feedback, and while it's interesting as to what's going on there, it's kind of distracting. Yeah? All right. So if you if you look at this map, I was trying to find the one that goes up until 2019, but it, it would have been a waste of my time uh, trying to put this together because it's the exact same pattern. We started out at independence with a whole rate of 4.2 per 100,000, and our average since the year 2000 has been 46.5 per 100,000. We are heading into one one specific direction. And believe me, it is not down, it's up. So if you look at this kind of setting, it kind of bothers me that you can be doing something continuously. It is heading in the, sa in the same direction, and yet there are persons who do not apply the, the philosophy that I'm going to explain to themselves. This philosophy is one that is central to violent studies. If you have been a part of a group that has been trying to solve violence for a very long time without any reduction being sustained, kindly consider yourself a part of the problem. Harsh, an extremely harsh philosophy that underpins <laughs> violence. But it is something that we have to, with some humility, begin to assess. So ontological security, the ontological security frame we use for young people is very simple. 
what will you be doing in the next five years? We drew this from working with persons in suicide. So that is, that is where it came from. Normally, if, if somebody plans calling to say they're going to kill themselves, when I worked in London in the suicide squad, uh, the question is, what are you going to have for breakfast tomorrow? And if, and if those persons provide you with an elaborate breakfast, you don't have to send a squad to them because they're not going to kill themselves. If they have no idea what they're going to have for breakfast and they don't really care what they're going to have for breakfast, a, a, a squad is sent to, to stay with them and to work through their suicide attempt, which would be imminent. In Jamaica, when you speak to young people and you ask them, what are you going to do in the next five years? It becomes very complicated when you, when you run these against categorical variables of location as in geosocial frames, specifically speaking about putting in inner city communities in three different groups from the most violent to the average to the low violence communities. When you go into the high violence communities, specifically located uh, in Montego Bay uh, and Kingston and St. Catherine, you find very low ontological security. In 2001, in a class, we were asked to find the four basic requirements of ontological security for youth. Our lecturer was very adamant that we should use no textbook and, in fact, would have lost points if we were going to use a textbook any at all. So nobody reading Charles Tilly, nobody reading Killing Ray, nobody reading any such work. We were supposed to, to spread as far as we could worldwide and to speak to young people, up to a thousand young people, to find out what they considered to be the requirements for ontological security. What would make you feel that in the next five years there is some sort of a future. So each of us 17 violent studies students at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, from 11 countries set out on this task. After speaking with youth from 127 countries, let me repeat that, 127 countries, we were clear of the basic requirements for youth to be stable. And since then, I have done the same research in Belize, Jamaica, Antigua, Trinidad, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Next slide. Slide, please. So what we found was that there are four requirements for young people to be stable. Number one is food. Number two, a safe environment. Number three, supportive parents. And number four, education and training. And we found that differentially distributed, if any single one of these four was missing, then there would be, there would be instability, social instability among youth. From birth in Jamaica, most boys are disadvantaged in all four areas. And that sets out Jamaica in every single international assessment to be extremely problematic. Because from birth, most boys you see are disadvantaged in all four areas. By the time they get to a dollar cents, the fight to raise them is almost lost. Okay, change slide, please. All right, so let's start with food. The first thing, the first thing that should hit you if you are, if you are, if you have any form of training in violence, when you pick up the survey of living conditions, 2014, or any 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 of them since then, is that boys are 2.7 times more likely to be underweight than girls. Now, let's step back a little bit. In order, of boys burn more energy requires higher replacements of energy, which means they require more food. In Jamaica, in Jamaica, boys are 2.7 times more likely to be underweight. I can give you the exact figures. 8.8% .8 of boys birth to five years old in Jamaica are underweight compared to 3.31 for girls. That is the kind of dilemma we start out with from the very onset for, for boys in Jamaica. Next slide. So if you look at if you look at food insecurity and depression among youth, and we're looking here at the three parishes I have so far done uh, what we call uh, a violence scan or viol or, or violence index. And so you're looking at male food insecurity, right? Look at St. James, 27%, right? Uh, then if you look at female food insecurity, you see where that is. 
males hungry full time, full time hunger. As in, we're talking about boys who explain to us that they learned that a handful of water can keep your stomach from getting hot. Mark you, they don't know that when the stomach gets hot, it is really eating itself, but that is how they explain it. And we're talking here, uh, we found the same thing in Belize in, in, in areas of Trinidad, which is so wealthy, as in Laventil, John John, Kampo, Bangladesh, we found the exact same pattern, right? If you look at male suicidal and female suicidal, you'll see that in particular parishes, when females don't get food, they they express high levels of, of suicidal tendency. On the other hand, don't do that. What they do is they, and I'll borrow the Belizean words, catch and kill. Next slide, please. All right. So how are how are youth responding? And by youth we mean 15 years to 24 years old. We're not talking about anybody 25 years or older here. If you look at St. James, the first thing that hits you is 70% of every single person out of the over 1,000 interviews we did, 70% of them had some way of gaining an income. Of course, a lot of this is legitimate, but we're talking about economic burden. So 70% of them carries the economic burden of their home. And that is defined as I am the main breadwinner line breadwinner in my house. 70%. Picture the kind of burden in Montego Bay. Of course, you know, Manchester of these three is the comparative frame. So it would have been better because it is the number two breadbasket of Jamaica. But if you look at females assisting, very tolerable, very low, very different world for them. If you look at males carrying alone, you can see the same pattern. Next slide, please. All right, so let's move to sense and reality of security. Please bear in mind that having a sense of security and a reality of security are two different things. Sense of security is developed over half of a generation. So we measure these things in 15 year blocks. For example, a lot of my friends in Colombia still believe they are not safe, even though Colombia has cut its murder rate dramatically. So sense of security takes a longer time than reality of security. Let's go. All right, so if you look at murder rates since averages since the year 2000, ours has dipped a little bit down to 46. Let me just update that. But if you look at the data here, this is up to 2016, you will see that Jamaica maintains its spot in fourth place. Let's go. And here's what is intriguing. In the developed countries, women account for 27 to 30% of all violent deaths. That is usually a sign that that country is not at war, meaning that there are few people dying and the proportion in terms of mugging is what is called a one to three ratio in 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 countries that have vile that has murders equivalent or comparative with countries at war you're looking at a ratio of one to nine or one to ten so women are calling for ten percent actually nine point four percent percent of violent deaths in jamaica all right and that's a sign that we're killing, that males are killing each other at such rapid rate that despite the fact that 118 women die each year in Jamaica since the year 2000, men are going 10 times that. Let's go. If you, if you, if you pull these by parishes, you begin to see, uh, if you look at that purple line, right, that green line represents the Civil War benchmark that, that Purple line represents the US-led invasion of Iraq, 205 per 100,000. And it is clear that for all males, and especially for males of the combatant age, Kingston and St. James are very unique. Let's go. Physical absence of parents. Interesting spelling there. Most peaceful inner city has 17% of fathers dead or in prison and 10% for mothers. 
when you look at the most violent communities in Jamaica, 37% of their fathers are either dead or in prison, and compared to 15% of mothers, which means the number one parent farm in the most violent communities is considered to be alternative or on my own. And some of these communities, we found up to 18% of young men saying from age 12, they have lived with absolutely no parents. There has been a lot of drama in Jamaica about absent fathers, but I have been very clear on this matter that it is both parents that are absent from, from, from most kids when they are in trouble. And that this absent father thing, you know, does require greater science. Let's go. So let's look at the national figures. In Jamaica, 82% of mothers are present in the home compared to 42%, which puts Jamaica in the middle of the world. The highest, the highest father presence countries would all be Catholic with an average of 68%. So Belize, being Catholic, would be, despite all its violence, would have 64% fathers. Mexico has literally 70% fathers in the home. People would know that. So those, those extremely Catholic countries would have high, high father presence. England is 56%. The United States is 54%. Jamaica is 42%. Needed to put that in context. When you go to an inner city, the first thing you recognize is that both father and mother dropped by 50% or close to 50%. So father presence dropped from 42 to 21. Mother presence drops from, from 82 to 43, which is basically 55%. So they, they are cut in half. When you go into, into the setting of inner city male killers, you will see that the mother, look at mother. That's the interesting thing. While father presence drops by four more percent, mother presence drops by 52.7%. Completely contrary to some of these books that are being used, guiding people into, the, into an ocean of madness about what happens with families in, uh, where there's violence. Then let's look at inner city female killers because I am now on a 14 year project looking at females who've killed you'll see the same pattern. Father drops and mother drops dramatically. Next slide, please. Parent involvement rating. What you're going to find is we have a rating. If a parent gets a rating below four, four and below, so below five, then we, we brand that as being poor parenting working with the young people to actually rate their families and explain why they give their families, their parents, that rating. Inner city uh, males, they give their father, so 36% of their father, whether their father are in the home, as in residential or ex-residential, they would have received a good rating compared to 70% of mothers. Inner city male killers, the father's own does not move so much. It stays at 32%. By the way, we're, we're covering here, literally, St. Catherine, as in Spanish town. We're talking here about Montego Bay, right? We're also talking here about uh, the, a belt of violence in, in Manchester, as well as a couple more parishes that we're, we're, we've not done a lot of work yet. But, but the, we're, he, we're talking here for a data set of about 4,000 young people. These data cannot be taken for a joke. Look at mother. Mother drops from 70% rating down to 22% rating because these mothers, without the support of the family, without the support of the society, without the support of governance, without the support of churches or civil society, end up torturing their children. So literally only one of five mothers get a high rating or a decent rating or a rating above five or above inner city females started from 51 for fathers and 63 and you would expect 51 for fathers because extra residential fathers are two to three times more likely to take care of their daughters than their sons 
but inner city females who've killed of the 48 we are working with 21 fathers dropped to 21 and mother drops to 28 it's a complete parenting disaster shall we go education and training and this is this is the end of the presentation we we accidentally started bumping into a few young men in about the last 20 years who, who would have been a part of enrolling university and so forth. And just by accident one day, uh, 16 years ago, to be precise, my research team and I were having lunch together. They had done an absolutely fabulous job on word assessing. And they said, sir, I think we need to begin to, to check on the impact of education uh, when, when it comes to inner city kids. So all of this data are about inner city young men. We were having a debate about, is it the people who eat a handful of grains per, per week who are healthy, or is it that healthy people require a handful of grain per week? Of course, we know it's the latter. So please look at these data and understand it is not just the presence of school that is making them stable, but the fact that everybody came together to ensure that they were in school. Are we clear on that? So using the boys who drop out before grade nine as the baseline, the first assessment we can use drawing on over 4,000 young people is that those who complete secondary school and sit at least three CXCs, which is a basic requirement to suggest right that you had completed school whether or not you pass yes or no we didn't care we just know that once we ask you did you sit some exams and you sat three or more then we would put you in this frame and for those who got the support system to be able to sit at least three cxc's there were four times less likely to be high risk than those in the baseline that dropped out of school before by grade nine what do we mean by high risk by high risk we had high risk medium risk low risk and no risk, right? The four categories that CSJP used and that we used in the VIP study in 2018. High risk means that you stab somebody, shot somebody, or you were shot or stabbed, or you are a gang member, okay? We did not include people who fight by using blunt instruments or punching each other. We're talking about people who use weapons, which meant they had a clear intent to harm. So they are high risk, okay? If, you, if, a, if a young man completed CAPE, he was 10 times safer than anyone who dropped out of school by grade nine. And if he enrolled in a university, he was 85 times safer than a boy who dropped out by grade nine. The data are clear that if we, if we begin to take the UNODC recommendations, the recommendations have been all over the world to create a better mix between force and social investment. We're going to begin to crack the problem. Thank you. Well, you know, Herbie, I, I was wondering whether or not you were actually listening to the program today, but I, I don't know if I'll have the time to speak about it later on, but thank you for that presentation. I just I can't help but saying though before I go to Puff Tate that I had a caller today who was trying to talk about the relationship between better policing and social interventions, etc. etc. And I just asked him a simple question to look at the 70. 70% of homicide victims, the 70% of homicide perpetrators. The seventy percent of people who are not in, in, in social education. And you look at pretty much the same age cohort. Well, thank you, Herbie, for giving us that kind of detail. Prof. Clayton, your Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let me see if I can share my slides. Can you see them? Yes. Very good. Okay. Oh, Excellent. Excellent. I'm going to be talking a bit about the uh, concept of resilience. We're going through a major crisis at the moment with the COVID-19 virus, which so far has infected about a million people, uh, killed nearly half a million, and is going to cost the world economy over $4 trillion. It's the most serious 
pandemic we've had since 1918, what's sometimes known as the Spanish flu, which is an H1N1 virus, which infected about 500 million people and killed somewhere, we're not sure, between 70 to 100 million. But when you look around the world, what you see is that there were very, very differential effects. Some countries had devastating effects, most obviously countries like the US, UK and Brazil. Some countries, including Jamaica, Finland and Norway, SAC, took very few casualties. And New Zealand is already COVID free. So it's important to ask what accounts for these differences, these marked differences between countries? Well, <clears throat> there are some, which is one, one measure is simply the measure of exposure. Um, countries which have a very high <clears throat> level of business or tourist commerce um, have a high level of exposure. But a more, probably a more important factor is whether governments took swift, early, and decisive action. In the US and Brazil, in particular, governments were somewhat averse for political reasons to taking action, and they suffered uh, very awful consequences as a result. A, th a third very important factor is the quality of information, which actually bundles together a number of variables, including the quality of scientific advice, a good communication strategy by the government, whether it be across the government, good ICT infrastructure, and the general level of digital media. In some countries, for example, <clears throat> they were able to install track and trace systems using people's smartphones, enable them to see people's contacts and uh, contact the contacts and deal very, very quickly with uh, people who are likely to be spreading the virus. And fourth, and more generally, was just the level of preparation in the country. Uh, Singapore had spent many, many years preparing for exactly this scenario. So they had all of these infrastructures and other arrangements in place. So all of these uh, are components of national resilience. This is not the this is not the, uh, there are more, obviously, more variables, but it gives you some sense of the diversity of variables that you have to take into account when you're thinking about which country is going to be most vulnerable to particular external shocks. But the question now is, well, which crisis do you actually prepare for? Um, if we had a major terrorist incident directed at tourists in Jamaica, for example, um, experience elsewhere suggests that you can lose 50% of your tourism industry overnight. If you have two terrorist incidents in quick succession, you're probably looking closer to 75% of your industry. Now, given that this industry is by far our largest employer and our second largest source of foreign exchange, this would be absolutely economic economically devastating impact. But then the question is, how much time and effort do we put in to preparing for that? How does it relate to, for example, the time and effort that we need to put in to preparing for climate change, or the time and effort that we have to dedicate to dealing with the fact that we're the fourth most violent country in the world? Well, the answer is, of course, you have to, uh, it's all on the basis of probability. You have to devote most resources to the problems that you think are most likely to happen or already happen. Now, of course, it's very easy to predict a crisis. Unfortunately, it's only possible to do so with hindsight. Trying to predict a crisis in advance is surprisingly difficult. There are reasons for that. One is simply com the complexity. There's a very large number of variables which interact in multiple ways. And a very simple example, even to think about whether your business is going to succeed or fail. You have to think about legislation, regulation, fiscal policy, politics, competition, consumer preferences, how they might be changing, possible market discontinuities, somebody invents something that makes your product obsolete, disruptive technologies, and so on. And that's just one simple decision for one entity. Another common problem is simply being too focused on the short term. Uh, we actually do spend a lot of time more dealing with the problems that we have right now. But the thing is that focusing on the short term actually makes it harder to understand the really important long term patterns. And this is where we can use uh, strategic planning tools, like, for example, foresight and technology road mapping, which focus on the underlying drivers of change, for example, demographics, economic development, and technology. These variables tend to be relatively stable. And they change slowly, which means that the results are more predictable. And let me just quickly walk you through an example of how this can work. 
If you look at some world population projections, the, these tend not to change very quickly. At the moment, we're on track to have somewhere around about 13 billion people by the time we get to the end of the century. We are also pretty confident that the median age is going to change. At the moment, the median age of planet Earth is about 29. By the time we get to 2050, it's going to be 41. The world is going to have a much, um, many parts of the world are going to be much older in the future. At the moment, 14% of the population of the US are um, over the age of 65. Uh, by the time we get to mid-century, that's going to be 24%. And other countries are going to go through a similar demographic transition. We also know that the world's population is going to be very much more urban. Uh, a few years ago, we went over the 50% mark. Today, it's 55%. By 2050, all the indications are that we'll be up to about 70% of world population. Now, of course, we can work out what that means. It means we actually have to build three or four new cities a year, every year for the next 30 years, each one the size of Mexico City, which is a population of over 20 million. And by the time we get to 2100, if this trend continues, we could be up to 90% urban. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but it's certainly going to be higher than it is today. Now, <clears throat> if we cross compare, let me see why my slides have to stop working. Can you see this slide? It says global GDP per capita. If you now overlap this with what we know about the rate of economic development, um, something really remarkable happened in 1750. Until that time, for almost all of human history, we've been poor. And if you were born poor, you could uh, predict with great confidence that you would die poor, and that your children would have essentially the same life that you did. 1750, round about, uh, was the start of the first industrial revolution, which uh, started to replace muscle power with machines. And we went through successive waves. We're now going to the fourth industrial revolution. And this has made us rich in a way that was inconceivable at all previous times of human history. Now, the growth curve we're on now is actually a true exponential, which means that we're not only getting richer, we're getting richer faster. In the first 10 years of this century, the world produced more economic output than in the previous 19th centuries combined. And what that means is global poverty is actually disappearing. Uh, just a sec, just a sec, Prof. Yeah. Um, is it? There's a problem? Yes, they're asking you, just are saying that there's a little bit of difficulty in reading the slides as they are, and they're asking you to click the book, uh, the book icon at the bottom right of the screen to go to slideshow. Let's see, let me try that. I think I actually have to go back into the... I'm very sorry, Orville, I actually don't see the icon. Can people see kind of expertise to help you either? Yeah, that's okay. Can people see my slides at all? I think they're there. Well, I'm seeing it, see the slides, but yes, I'm, 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 I'm seeing it quite clearly. You're seeing them quite clearly? Yes. I'm seeing them. This, uh, yes. I'm seeing them this, uh, Wait, where's the book icon? Let me just try and um, get some. Where's the book icon? So I can just go through the slides. That's the one. Okay. Better. That's better. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. See That's better. Okay. Very, very good. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, in nineteen ninety nine. Uh, there were some 1.7 billion poor people, poor people using the uh, UN um, benchmark, benchmark, which I think is something like one dollar and six cents per day. So by 2013, that had more than uh, halved to 767 million. By 2018, that was down to 600 million. 
Much of this obviously due to the development of countries like China and India. But it's very important to understand that this process is, is nowhere near the end. We're not even sure if it has ended. And as we go into the fourth industrial revolution, we actually expect to see this process accelerate. Now, let's put a couple of these um, key drivers together and try and get a sense of what the world is going to look like in a few years' time. Well, it's going to be significantly larger. It's going to be significantly older. It's going to be a lot richer, and it's going to be predominantly Arab. The global demographic will shift. By the time we get to mid-century, something like half of the population of the planet will be in Asia, and about 25% in Africa. As we were saying a minute ago, by the time we get to 2050, probably something like 70% of humanity will be living in cities. So by the time we get to the end of the century, there will be anywhere from 2.5 to 5.5 billion more people than there are now living in cities. And what that means is that we are going to need a lot more food, a lot more water, a lot more energy, and a lot more raw materials than we do at present. But there are some indicators which are potentially, you know, which are running in the opposite direction, and where it may have the potential to completely disrupt this process of development. By the time we get to 2030, and we're nearly there now, something like half of humanity will be living in areas with acute water shortages. And of course, the uh, huge problem, climate change. By the time we get to the end of the century, the world average surface temperature will be anywhere from two to seven degrees above the pre-industrial level. At that point, many parts of the planet's surface will become uninhabitable. And so it's, uh, we're now looking at a fork in the road, a very sharply bifurcated future. We either make it through and uh, become significantly uh, richer than we are, or we fail to meet the challenge of climate change, in which case the world ends up uh, in a much poorer place than it is now, with uh, much of humanity forced to become environmental refugees. Um, <clears throat> by some indicators, um, countries like Bangladesh, where maybe a third of the land area is uh, going to be vulnerable, we could be looking at potentially 100 million refugees. And it's very hard to see from that country alone. And it's impossible to see where we're going to, how we, the world can possibly absorb that kind, of, um, that kind of mass migration. So let's think about what this world means and we think about strategies for resilience. Well, what this clearly, uh, what this gives us is a very clear strategy. We have to, uh, or a strategic direction. We have to find ways to increase the efficiency with which we produce food, energy, and water, and how we handle our waste. We have to make a transition to low and zero carbon energy supplies. We have to adjust to an aging society, which means investing in areas like biomedical science and robotics. And we have to find some radically new solutions for urban living, which means what kind of buildings we put up, how our transport systems work, and the kind of work that people do. So by thinking about the major patterns that will shape the future, we can then start to see the, um, the, the first outline of a national strategy for building resilience. So whatever the outcome, we will be in better shape to survive. Now, let's come back to the one we started discussing at the beginning, pandemics. It's very important to note that the number of new diseases is actually increasing. Between 1960 and year 2000, or shortly after year 2000, somewhere of the order of 335 new diseases were recorded. And about three quarters of these are um, zoonotic diseases. They come from animals and uh, the virus. Um, crosses the species barrier and infects humans. There are reasons for this, including the rapid destruction of remaining global habitats, um, and human population growth and patterns of chaotic urbanization. We have about a billion people in the world living in informal settlements without proper sanitation, breathless disposal, uh, people eating wild animals and keeping animals for food. And this increases the opportunities for viruses to cross the species barrier. There's an enormous reservoir of uh, viruses out there. There's, there are some estimates suggest another 500 coronaviruses identified in bats, in bats alone. Uh, one species in particular, Horseshoe bat. Many of these are probably harmless to humans, but there are a number, we're not sure how many, but dozens, that can infect human lung tissue 
and cause SARS-like diseases. So there's a vast reservoir of uh, <clears throat> potential problems there. Uh, and, and, and viruses that can, can cross the species barrier. And the problem, the conclusion is, is that there absolutely definitely will be more pandemics in the future. Uh, we don't know where and we don't know when, but they will come. Again, with this kind of knowledge, you can start to think about strategies for building resilience. So with this approach, uh, foresight-based approach, what you can do is you can see a broad, broad out the probable future shape of the world. You're not trying to predict it. You're developing different scenarios. We could end up here or we could end up there. Then use um, scenario planning to identify what you can do to increase the chances of getting something more, uh, more optimal, a getting closer to uh, a preferable outcome. Or if we get a worst case outcome, what can we do to mitigate the impact on the country in which we live? So going through the, the crisis that we're in at the moment, the COVID-19 pandemic, what it does is it shows us where we currently lack resilience. Um, what that really means is that have we got the ability to absorb and respond to a serious challenge, a major threat, a serious shock, while still continuing to function, keeping essential services running, uh, mitigating the impact on society, reducing the harm to the economy. So what we can actually adopt is a strategy then to build national resilience. It's always a good idea to look for win-win tactics, i.e. things you can do that solve multiple problems. These are things that it would make sense to do anyway, even if the crisis doesn't happen. And here's a few examples. This came out of a study that we did on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the important thing about all of these is that they would be good ideas anyway, even if they were not also part of uh, building resilience against another pandemic. So, for example, you would want to diversify the economy because you have uh, because not all sectors are affected equally. You would want to reduce the dependence on particularly vulnerable sectors like tourism. Build up a sovereign wealth to provide a cushion against environmental impact. Bring all of the unbanked into a banking system so that the government has a way to get resources directly to the people who most need them. A government, government can't really tell people to lock down in their yard if they need to earn money that day in order to eat. So it's very important to bring people into a system where you can get cash payments directly to them. Invest in schools so they can teach people how to uh, teach um, their pupils what to do in a health crisis and how to pay. Building good information systems, like for example, the one I mentioned earlier, uh, both China and Taiwan linked their health and travel databases so they could immediately see who was at risk, who had just arrived in the country, who had a profile of particular symptoms. South Korea linked health records to cell phones so that anybody could check their phone and see if they're in close proximity to some of the virus. So we need to build those kinds of systems that will support those kinds of applications. Very important point. Don't try to get back to how things were before. Now, many people say that we would really like to get back to how things were. I think that would be a tragic mistake. If we go back to how things were before the COVID-19 pandemic, it would mean that we had learned nothing from, the, from, the, from the, the pandemic. It would mean that we haven't made any effort to identify and absorb the lessons. For example, migrating to online teaching, conference, business, work. Why would we go back to the way we did things before? If anything, we should be looking to extend this program. This is a very rare opportunity to migrate Jamaica to an all digital economy which is an absolutely essential component of international competitiveness. This is something that we should have done anyway, but the pandemic gives us a very pressing reason for do doing so. Um, look at the digital switchover process. Um, we've been, this, this has been under discussion for 10 years. The final recommendations were just delivered to cabinet. It really is about giving Jamaica 
the a modern internet and media infrastructure. And by building apps on top of that, it also gave the government the ability to detect and respond immediately to the next crisis, such as a pandemic. We need to look at modern intensive food production technologies to ensure that we can always feed ourselves, regardless of whatever happens in international markets or to international transport and supply chains. We need to look at things like additive manufacturing so that we can, if necessary, come through a crisis and still make the manufactured goods that we need. We require all new buildings that we that go up in this country to be built to net zero or energy plus standard. These are buildings that generate as much power as they, as they consume to permanently reduce our dependence on imported fuel. If we take steps like this, we would not only be in our economic best interest, it would also make us less vulnerable to any global crisis which disrupted manufacturing, shipping, and global supply chains. So I would suggest that the way we look at the COVID-19 pandemic as a crisis is, uh, should be informed by the spirit of this quote from Ron Emanuel, the current mayor of Chicago. He said, never let a crisis go to waste because it's an opportunity to do what you thought you could not do. If we learn the lessons from this pandemic and adopt a national strategy to build resilience to every aspect of life, we could be, we could emerge from this stronger than ever before. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Prof. I want to offer a better expression. Um, bearing in mind the fact that he talked about rising sea levels and all that, I would have said I've been flooded by a lot of information. But really, thank you so much. So much. Um, we now have um, some short comments from um, Brigadier Mason. Okay, thanks, Prof. Um, <clears throat> so the, I particularly enjoyed the presentations. I thought they were informative. I think I wish to narrow the comments to two main um, concepts that in the military setting, because I think. <clears throat> I would want to speak on the on the military side of things. I think it acknowledged. I, I did hear that, Brig, Brigadier. Can you say it again for me, please? You said. Yes, I think I, I want to narrow my comments on the military side, the JDF side, um, <clears throat> whilst acknowledging that we are dealing with uh, complex issues that pervades several agencies and and several variables to make my comments um first of all just limiting to um, a military perspective all right first of all i think in this covid environment and the issue of crime and violence there are five factors that i I wish to mention, and then I'm going to elaborate main on one. The five I'm going to comment on um, includes public, public trust. Um, there's no, you can't gain the efficacy you want without public trust. There's the collaboration or the synchronization of the resources. And that really speaks to strategy and um, the need for strategic balance. I want to mention the issue of poverty because much of the issues would have a basis in the conditions related to poverty. The next issue I want to raise is a matter of, for Jamaica, the absence of social safety nets um, so that the vulnerable do not have the options that um, you know would would obtain in developed societies. And then the last one I'd mention is the issue of capabilities. 
and I'm going to focus now on the military capabilities. So when, when we look at, at problems or issues, um, in this case, there, there are some, some actors in the environment and the actors, um, they would constitute the threat in this issue. It would be the, the, the virus itself. And in terms of the wider crime and violence, we're talking about the, the agents of, of violence. Um, <clears throat> they, they are the citizens, including the diaspora. We have our law enforcement agencies that we collaborate and try to synchron synchronize the, our efforts with. There's the government, um, private sector, and NGOs. So the capabilities that we aim to improve and continue to work, um, it's, it's in six areas. And these are the areas that we try to gain um, through technology the, the greatest efficacy. The first and most important in my view would be the issue of leadership. And the military generally focuses great effort on preparing its leaders at all levels. The, the second one has to do with intelligence. And the, so that you have greater efficacy, you do not end up um, net fishing, but spear fishing, where you definitely are able to target, identify, and, um, and pursue the perpetrators um, in terms of the wider crime, but in terms of the COVID, clear, clearly it would be understanding the effects of the, 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 the virus and, um, and on how it can have a security consequence. The, the issue of our ability to move and dominate space whether it's our airspace, sea space, land space, and also cyber is, is the next domain that we would have aimed to improve our efficacy. The next capability has to do with our, our, our sustainment. Um, we want to be able to deploy anywhere within the territorial space, um, any of the domains we need to be able to um, sustain ourselves um, in those environments. And the two last I'd mentioned um, is clearly in terms of, of, the, of our firepower and that the fact of minimum force and restraint we want to, because we primarily in this environment operate in an urban setting against our own citizens necessarily, and so the, the weaponry we use um, has to bear in mind um, the, the principles of minimum force. And lastly, the, the capability of protection, where we aim to protect our troops, protect our bases, um, and, and cause all the, our systems to ensure that um, we, we are, we are fit to fight. Um, for the COVID-19, for example, the chief of defense staff would have confined the, the troops and um, organized the work in what I would consider in groupings and keeping those groupings together so that we would minimize the threat of the virus. So th those are the comments I would make. I think the issue of strategic balance is what we are missing. All the issues raised pertaining to violence and victims and perpetrators and youth, um, it all has to do, we, we have seen evidence of, of actions taken over many years um, in terms of youth intervention, poverty alleviation. Um, the, 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 the problem in my view is that we lack strategic balance. Um, and that is what we need to be able to get right so that we can um, cause a sustainable fix. It's um, never an overnight fix. Um, so 
that is the issue, the area that I think we need to to focus on. How do we achieve stra strategic balance in the face of the um, the nature of the threat? So th those would be my comments. Sir. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, um, can I say how, how proud I am to be Jamaican here? And by the way, Puff, you are Jamaican. You are here long enough, right? <laughs> Clayton. Um, and, I, and I say this before I, I move. I'm taking about 30 seconds to say this. That I've always been convinced that we have the capability from all spheres. I've always thought that the JCF has investigative capability. I always thought that the JDF um, has the capability of um, linking with the JCF, putting in putting the, man, the men and intelligence on the ground to do whatever is necessary. And, and I always knew that the behavioral scientists and the other social scientists and the faculty of social scientists and the rest of the university community have the capability as long as we put our minds to Um, Dr. Taylor, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to put Oh, I'm sorry. So no one heard what I'm saying. Uh, maybe all the better. So I'm saying, cutting a long story short, that I am very, very pleased and very proud to be Jamaican um, because we, all of us live here. This is our little space, and we clearly have the understanding. And I do believe that from every single sector that's represented here, every body of research, every researcher, um has an understanding as to how we can go forward you know i i remember i was saying taking tales out of school it's not a charter house conversation charter house who's conversation but i was there sitting at officers club one night and um it's one of the few times i've ever felt stupid i and i was following the grand narrative about the criminal elements um outgunning the security forces etc and it was almost as in unison where the senior men just turned around in a very slow eyes right and eyes left at the same time and turned and looked at me with almost a condescending eye and they said to me, you know, no, no doubt we actually have the capability of taking anywhere that we want to take and hold anywhere. And I said, okay, all right. Um, and then after the explanations took place, I I understood very clearly that. We do have the capability to respond in terms of force. That is mopping it up. On the other hand, though, being a behavioral scientist, I clearly understand the importance of the rest of um, of trying to reduce the violence mill mill production. We have space for about three questions. I'm going to ask Major Blackwood to marshal for me. First question. Right, Doctor T. We do have a question from. Ellington, and the question is, who should lead on the nation's strategic balance? Who should lead on the nation's strategic balance? All right. Um, who wants to take that one? Well, I, I, I could make a comment. They, clearly, the strategic balance with, with, with the, that, that resides within the the, the office of the, the prime minister. It would be, um, ultimately it is, it is an issue of governance. It is, it is in cabinet, it is in those deliberations that would cause decisions to be taken at, at, about the wide ranging variables in the society. What goes to education, what goes to um, social services, what goes to national security. I think, I think that is especially where resources are concerned because you demonstrate strategy through your, um, your recurrent and capital budget. And that, that is where, and, and strategic balance doesn't mean spending equally in each area strategic balance means that you are able to tackle the, the the heart of the problem um through the resources that you 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 provide 
to treat with that problem. And strategic balance also comes about by causing the, the systems to integrate the elements. So, so, so that, that is where we, 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 are, we are lacking that level of integration across the, the ministries and departments. Um, so that you, you gain greater efficacy. And that kind of empowerment can only um, come from, from the government. Mm -hmm. And that would be my response. Yes, may I comment there too? Or yes. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, hey, I think it's a very important question. Um, I, I feel very strongly about this when it comes to um, issues like national security, something that is so clearly in the overriding national interest, I would wish that as much of that area as possible could be taken out of the domain of sectarian, petty party politics. There are many issues on which we could build um, a national consensus, and that would take us far way forward. As you know, um, <clears throat> the PSOJ sponsored a crime consensus move. With I serve on that committee. We're trying to get both of the parties to agree um, on the way forward in terms of dealing with crime. If only we can build that political consensus, we can fix our problems. In fact, I have always believed that if we, we, we know rough, we know how to fix crime. We know a lot of things we need to do. It probably would not take us more than five or six years to reduce the level of violent crime and corruption in this country significantly if only we could build a bipartisan political consensus. If I could just give you one example from another area entirely. You look at Denmark's energy policy. Back in the 70s, Denmark realized with the result of the first great oil crisis, they were very dependent on imported oil. They realized how vulnerable they were. They had a national debate about the way forward, and they decided that they were going to build a, an economy based on renewable energy. That was not politically contentious from that point on. It was a bipartisan issue. Everybody agreed that that was the way forward. Today, Denmark is a renewable energy superpower. They're actually exporting energy from renewable sources. That shows you how far you can come and how quickly, once you have this leadership issue resolved, once something becomes a matter of bipartisan consensus, you can change the world. But here's, a, here's my question in, in that, though, because I listened carefully to what Herbie said. And let's be truthful to our history here. There's a very direct link between the present day outcomes on the one hand and the kind of social policies that we have had or not have, as well as the political and deliberate strategies. Now, there are parliamentarians who either were around or who were certainly were around, whether or not they were actually involved in the process, we can't say that, and I wouldn't dare to say that. But there are parliamentarians who were active politicians during that critical period of the 1970s or late 1970s and 80s when we were creating this mess. Um, do we therefore say that the kind of leadership that we need must exclude all of those persons and maybe the institutions that might have been around at that time. Herbie. Yeah, Herbert. I think your mic is on mute. Yeah, your mic is on mute, Herbie. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Orville, can you hear me or Oni? Please, a black. I can hear you now. Okay, uh, and you're hearing me. Yes, we can hear you now. Right, I'm saying I am. I am not particularly concerned about individuals. In my training, we've never uh, been individual or, or human centered in in the case of. Uh, who and, and, and where and so forth. We're usually concerned about the structures that are put in place because uh, if you put a structure in place, 
then uh, there should be a set of sanctions for those who go against those structures. The problem in Jamaica, uh, you know, was summarized in a movie in which it says we have good things written on paper, but it's written in pencil that it becomes very flexible that anybody can remove it for the purpose of their own personal uh, gains. And I think that is, is where the structure is, the problem is. So quite often, if we put things in place, then it becomes, it, it, we have a culture that says certain people can, can get immunity or impunity from carrying out those things. And that is why the corruption has to be the center of, 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 in terms of reducing corruption has to be very central to any way forward. So, so what I'm saying is not just the individuals, but the culture of accepting people going around principles that we put in place to move forward, whether they are bipartisan, yes or no. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I think we have what, one more time. For, 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 let me, no, go ahead. Hello. We do have a comment from Professor Harriet. Professor Harriet, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes, I wanted to ask a question of Brigadier Mason. Would you be kind enough? Kind enough. Yeah, a question of Brigadier Mason. Hello? Please go ahead. Yes. yes. To elaborate a little on this idea of strategic balance. What concretely does it mean? What does it look like? Okay, I think I, I, I think you got that. I missed some of it myself. Um, okay. Just saying elaborate on strategic things. Yeah, yeah. What does it look like? All right. The, all right. The, the, the construct I would use um, <clears throat> is is a, as a simple construct of ends, ways, and means. I think that's the <clears throat> that's the 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 U.S. military tend to um, gravitate to to this construct, <clears throat> and um, overall strategy is about synchronizing resources that's that's essentially what it is and you have to synchronize those resources to meet the the end state that you are trying to get to so i think we, we all agree that the um, we we know of the resources and actors that we have in any country um i've mentioned those those um from the government through to the law enforcement agencies, um, leadership budget, the academia, industry, all of those exist. However, it needs an entity to synchronize all of these all of these bodies. And that is a, a, a function of leadership. It needs somebody who, and I, I say somebody or a body, who is sufficiently seized with the core competences of, of all the agencies to be able to synchronize their activities. So you, you don't have redundancies. Um, a mention was made of the JDF's um, National Service Corps program versus um having one central youth um investment entity <clears throat> so it is it would be issues such as those that a synchronizing entity would be able to remove redundancies achieve efficiencies um and to to get to the problem at, at greater economy um, so we would have to agree and i agree completely with um, Dr. Gale that corruption is one of those issues that robs a society of its resources. And certainly, um, synchronizing the resources of the country to um, eliminate or reduce corruption across um, the society would, would clearly 
give more resources to the country. There's the issue of the youth. The youth, they are the ones dying. They are the ones killing. Um, so they are both victims and perpetrators. And so, and we, we know that the families are not at the homes. And therefore, how do we synchronize our resources to, to, to get, um, because we have a number um, of, of the, that we are talking about. So, um, so it is, that, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. There has to be consensus on where we get the greatest bang for the buck. Um, and then the resources are so balanced and synchronized to, to, to get to the heart of the issue. Um, otherwise, <clears throat> as I, we, all, we all agree, if you don't spend um, upfront with a child, then you're gonna spend on the back end anyway, either burying him, incarcerating him, or defending him. <clears throat> so um, that, that's what I mean. Um, Brigadier, I, I listen, but I, I, I know Commissioner Blake is, is listening at the same time, listening at, and paying full attention. We only have about a, a minute left, but there is something that has always plagued me. Because my view is that you still need a kind of civilian solution. But bear in mind, you're talking about the military as having been, as being a central repository of control. But by definition, the ministry, the, sorry, the military is under the direct control and supervision of the government, that is the prime minister. And therefore, it would, it would make, the, make the likelihood or the potential for corruption still very, very present. And so why not have a model that involves a constitutional change or something where you have a constabulary where the commissioner like the Commission of Income, the Auditor General, the, um, and a number of other entities, right, at the DPP, report directly to Parliament, bearing in mind the fact that a, a constable um, has the power and authority to act independently in spite of any kind of directive from the Prime Minister or anybody else. Wouldn't that be a, a, an alternative model? And um, before you answer, I just want to say that we are almost totally out of time. Um, at 16.40 hours, we'll be having vice, the Vice President of the CMA, Lieutenant Colonel Blair Waddington speaking. So we have 30 seconds for that answer, and then I will say sign on. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wish I had, I wish I had an answer for that. Um, however, I, I noticed a lot of the assumptions um, is that once it is it is within the security forces, then um, inherently there is or the government inherently there is corruption. The issue of corruption for me, I believe we need to take a step back and have some empirical um, um, discourses around it. Our discourses that are, that that are benefit from empirical evidence. A lot of what we speak about with corruption. Um, is centered around perception and not necessarily driven by study. So we talk about, um, um, we use terms, you know, like um, inherently corrupt or, or, or um, excessively corrupt or, or entrenched corruption, but there's no study whatsoever. The closest we have gone to looking at a study regarding corruption is um, um, studies such, like, such as the LAPAP report, look at corruption perception survey that gives a, a rather um, frightening um, result. The perception and the reality are so wide um, apart and stuff. So whilst I will not be able to tell you that that is the route in terms of reporting to parliament, it certainly is um, an alternative. But what I, I think the, 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 the more useful discourse should be is to what extent are we, um, um, what, what is the extent of this problem that we're, we're, we're struggling with? And to date, I don't think that there's anybody that can give us that answer. There's a whole lot of perception going on. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about the JCF being excessively corrupt. 
But then I asked myself a question. We don't try to sound defensive. Yeah, I'm just um, in, a, in the next five seconds that I have, um, Dr. Taylor, without um, sounding defensive, we're talking about facts. We're speaking about facts, a, a more useful approach to this discourse. Um, and so when we look at an organization that requires almost two years for an, for an individual to join, because they have to go through some rigorous background check, um, polygraph of every member. We have more oversight than anybody, any such body in this side of the world, none. I was in Northern Ireland recently, Professor Clayton was there with me also, um, when the Northern Ireland police was boasting at being one of the most oversighted police organization in the world. And after they name every single oversight body, we have an equivalent one. And when they're finished, we had two more. And so the, the whole idea of um, an organization like the JCF um, be inherently corrupt, even when the research is and the studies show otherwise, um, is something that we need to look at. So if we're going to tackle the issue of corruption, we need to know the magnitude of the problem. We can't um, treat with a problem unless we properly define what it is. Eh? And so rather than looking at strategies immediately to deal with a problem that is shaped our own perception, I think what we need to do usefully, and we need it, we as an organization, and not I, I, I focusing mainly on the JCA where this is concerned, but we as an organization need to understand how deep this level of corruption is, and also within the government. I think sometimes our, our, our arguments and our discourses um, set us up in the international community more than we deserve and things. But we do need to look at other structures, alternative structures for um, to treat with this. My commission, I have to exercise, Chair, my committee is here. I just to say to you that you know, what is weird about this is that you are the one who introduced the notion of corruption in the JCA because that was what I was talking about. I was talking about societal corruption. In fact, I know what the data look like in regard to where the actual per the perception of corruption and whether or not people say they're paid bribes. And then the number, there's, a, there's quite a gap between between what people talk about in terms of the transparency international <laughs> opinion <laughs> polls, we talk about high perception, but only 30% of Jamaicans have their opinion right But it's about double that what they put this report to our judges. It's about 10%. That is about 10 Tony knows about that as well, too. Colleagues, I think that we have come to the end of a very meaningful um symposium. I do believe that some of the best heads in the country have knocked, and I think that we are moving in the direction. Hopefully, we can synthesize this into policy um, later on, because many times we talk, and hopefully we'll shake up the, the policymakers a little bit so that we can grapple with the issue in a, in a very tangible way. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Brock. Thank, thank you all.